Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm the host for today's session. And uh, our guest, before I introduce our guest speaker, uh, who's with Merson Fuses, who's a longtime industry partner of Easy Powers, I wanted to touch on a couple of housekeeping uh, duties. First of all, uh, anyone attending today's presentation will receive a certificate of attendance that are useful for EAU credits. And anyone that has a question, please use the question control box on the webinar control panel. And time permitting, we'll be able to get to those at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce David Simeon. Our guest speaker, David, you have the podium. Thank you so much, um, Jim. Um, and thank you to everyone um, for attending the session today. Um, like Jim said, we're going to go over some fuse construction and performance. Um, let me just make sure that I am showing the correct screen to you guys here and pull up the slideshow so we can begin. As Jim stated, uh, my name is David Simeon. Uh, I'm with Merson and I'm the solutions engineer for the South Central region. Um, and basically what we, we do is put on a lot of these different um, webinar series. And this one in particular, we'll, we'll go through the fuse construction, um, some short circuit operation of the fuses in regards to how those fuses um, are operating underneath those overcurrent conditions. Um, right, whether that's short circuit or an overload um, condition, um, the cycle fatigue, right, what can cause the fuse to fail, um, and then also some of the the UL uh, fuse classes um, that are found in the, in today's world, right. Um, so without further ado, um, first of all, we're going to discuss the the most commonly found fuse, which is the time delay uh, dual element ferro style fuse. Um, and this ferrule um, fuse body is um, utilized for UL style fuses with amp ratings um, up to 60 amps. Um, and beyond 60 amps, uh, we, we get into the blade construction. Um, and we'll discuss that later on in the presentation. Um, so we'll go through the, the, the construction of the, the dual element ferrule style fuse. And then we'll go into the construction of the blade style fuse. Um, first of all, to begin the construction of the dual element ferrule style fuse, we have to start with the, the um, spring and plunger assembly. Um, and to build the spring and plunger assembly, we have to start with the spring and plunger housing, which is um, pictured here, right? Um, and once we have the spring and plunger housing, um, the spring is added into the plunger. And then once we add the spring into the plunger, the plunger is inserted into the spring and plunger assembly. Okay, so this just gives you a visualization of the plunger here. All right, and then a heater tab is added um, to the outside of the plunger assembly. All right, so you can see the heater tab here, and this heater tab helps concentrate the heat um, and also carries the current, right? And during an overload um, condition, the heater is going to help um, concentrate the heat um, onto the plunger. And we'll discuss the operation of the fuse um, underneath these overload conditions um, in regards to the spring and plunger assembly and how it plays a role um, in being able to limit those over overload conditions um, during the uh, short circuit situation. Okay, um, next we add the, the short circuit element. Um, so once we complete the spring, uh, um, plunger assembly, we can solder the short circuit element onto uh, the spring and plunger assembly. And the way we do that is utilizing an EU tactic solder, right? Um, the, this, the element plays an, a very important role in limiting the let through energy during a fault. Um, you can also see these, these U shape or bends, which basically gives the element more durability during manufacturing. Right. Um, if you don't know, a lot of times whenever we are uh, building these fuses, uh, these fuses are hand assembled in the plant. Right. So this basically prevents any bending 
and breaking of the element during the manufacturing process. Um, and then, like I said, we have the EU Tectic solder. So the, the element is soldered um, to the plunger with this EU Tectic solder, which is a temperature sensitive solder. And this, this solder will melt at a specified temperature um, based off of you know what engineering has designed um, that solder to do, right? And like I said, for those overload conditions, and now this dual element is complete. We then add in the, the rubber grommet, right? And that rubber grommet basically keeps um, the filler material from interfering with the plunger assembly during an overcurrent event, right? I haven't talked about the filler, but we'll talk about it here in the next couple of slides. Um, and then we slide the body of the fuse um, over the assembly, all right, to um, complete the construction of the, the housing portion of the fuse. And then we place a fiber washer in place on the plunger end to help prevent any of that fill um, from leaking out. And then once we have that fiber washer on the end, we then add in an end cap. And then for this particular example, uh, we have a rejection ferrule style end cap on this specific fuse. So we fill the body with sand, right? I mentioned the filler and how the, the grommet keeps the filler from interfering with the, the old, from interfering with the, the spring and plunger assembly, right? So we typically fill the body of the fuse with silica sand. Um, it's not the regular sand that you may think of or that you may find on the beach, right? Um, the engineers use um, specific grain sizes and mixtures of sand to get um, different performances out of the fuses, right? So we fill the fuse with the sand um, and during the operation or well, during the, the assembly of the fuse, we put it on a vibration table, right? Like I mentioned, these are all hand assembled. However, whenever we are filling them with sand, um, we, we place them on the vibration table, um, we fill them up, uh, then we, we vibrate the fuses, then we fill them up again until the fuse is nice and compact. We really want to get it nice and compact to help with the, the performance of the fuse and, and, and utilizing that silica sand to really quench that arc. And we'll, we'll talk about that later in a couple of the other slides. Right, and then we add a fiber washer um, on the open side. And then on top of that fiber washer, we then put the end cap, right? And then this, the, the end cap is typically soldered um, or brazed um, on the end, right? And then everything is heated, right? And this, uh, this solder and brazing together helps make a solid electrical connection. So that kind of brings us to our first question um, of the day. And if you guys don't mind, um, it, it'll be a multiple choice question for the first question. Um, and you can just put your, your answers in the chat, right? So the first question is, um, what part of the fuse is going to limit the lead through energy um, during a fault? Is it A, the rubber grommet, B, the fuse element, or C, the heater? And I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to write your responses in the chat if you would like. Okay, just to continue on, the answer is, going to be the fuse element, right? Um, when I was talking about the construction of the fuse and, and going through those few steps at the beginning, um, I spoke about how the fuse element um, will assist, uh, is the part of the fuse that, that, that works at limiting that lead through energy during the fault. Um, so continuing on um, with, with typical types of fuse construction, um, once we get to 100 amps and above, right? Um, previously, we saw we saw the ferro fuses that are, you know, um, 60 amps and below, right? And then you have that range where you have from 60 to 100 amps. Where sometimes, depending on what the manufacturer choose, um, they will go with either the bladed construction or with the ferro type construction. Um, so we'll go through um, the construction of a bladed fuse, which is a little bit different um, than the ferro style fuse. Um, so first of all, in order to begin with the bladed fuse construction, right, we have to utilize the building block um, of the bladed fuse, right? So we use this particular block here, and then we add on the blade, and right? And, and in order to, to do so, the blade is brazed to the block um, to create this blade block terminal assembly. Um, just for your knowledge, uh, the block is typically uh, brass and the blade would be copper, right? So It'll be copper and, and, uh, 
the, the copper and brass. And the reason why we utilize two different types of metal is really to reduce the cost, right? Um, it would be a lot more expensive to build the whole blade block terminal, terminal out of just copper. I mean, and also in regards to performance, um, the benefit is not as substantial enough to really justify an all copper assembly. So um, next, in order to complete the construction of the bladed fuse, right, we have to have and add in the elements, right? And the elements are, are soldered onto the terminal. Um, basically, when you think about these elements and as we add more elements, um, just give me a second, as, as we add more elements into the fuse, um, the, the higher the ampacity the fuse has, right? Um, and, and I'll go through the next couple of slides to kind of show what this means and also how this affects the performance of the fuse and also the size of the fuse, right? Because the more elements that we add in a row, the, the, the larger the diameter of the fuse will be. So a lot of times if you see a very large diameter fuse, um, that means it's going to have a higher ampacity rating um, versus whenever you look at those um, maybe medium voltage fuses where the elements are a lot um, longer. Um, and that's due to those elements having a higher voltage rating. And I'll also discuss that later on in, in a couple of the other slides, right? Um, the typically, the fuses will have more than one element. And typically, the element will be um, a copper or silver. Um, these are the most common materials um, utilized um, for these elements. Um, and, and as you can see, the notches here, right, these notches that I'm pointing to here, um, they are stamped out across uh, cross-sectional areas, um, and, and these are what open during an overcurrent situation, right? So each of these notches is, is about 125 to 150 volts, right? So it's like I, I talked about earlier, right, with the, the medium voltage fuses being a lot longer, right? So these elements would be a lot longer for say for instance a fuse that's up to 15 kv you're going to need a lot more of these notches in order to sustain those voltages right so just to kind of give you a picture of 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 what is within this fuse and how these elements operate in regards to the current and also the voltage all right so we we continue to keep adding elements um, based on the amp rating of the fuse so the more elements we add, like I mentioned before, the higher the amp rating. Um, so for this example in particular, let's just say for instance, each one of these elements um, is 100 amps, right? Then we have four rows of elements making this a 400 amp fuse. And to continue the, the bladed fuse construction, um, we add another blade block terminal assembly um, on the, the, the opposite end, right? So, and this is also soldered onto the elements. And then we add the body of the fuse, right? And the body of the fuse is put on and is staked into place. Um, these fuse bodies can be made from a, a number of, of different things like paper and ceramic, but the most common is, is GMG, a form of um, fiberglass. And then we fill the body of the fuse with sand like we did previously, right? With the the ferro style construction fuse, right? And the, the filler that is added um, is, is usually a quartz sand. And this filler acts as an insulator um, when the element melts. And we'll discuss that a little bit further on in the presentation. But we get to the next set of questions, right? Um, and this question here, if you guys wanna go ahead and, and put some answers in the chat. Um, the more rows of elements we use in the fuse, the higher the blank will be. Is it A, the voltage rating, B, the interrupting rating, or C, the amp rating? And you guys can just put in A, B, or C. You don't have to necessarily type it out. The answer to this question is going to be the amp rating. Again, just really reiterating um, how those elements are utilized within the fuse construction and what the purpose of those elements are, right? The more rows of elements that we have, like we showed in our example, um, with four rows of 100 amp um, elements, then the higher the ampacity will be. Um, now, now that we've kind of gone into the components of the fuse, um, you know, the construction of the fuse, um, the inner workings of that specific fuse, 
right? We can go into like what what the fuse is used for, um, right? It is to protect equipment, of course, and people from overcurrent conditions, right? That's that's what um, these overcurrent devices are utilized for in the field in these applications, right? And in order to understand um, these overcurrent conditions, um, we need to know that there are, are really two types of current, right? Um, the first is going to be direct current, which is commonly referred to as DC current. And then the second is going to be alt alternating current, which is gonna be referred to as AC current. Um, in this specific presentation, um, we, we're gonna utilize AC current as an example, um, but it is also important to note that it, it is easier um, for a fuse um, to clear an alternating fault than it is for the fuse to clear a direct fault, right? And as you can see from the illustration, the reason being is, right, with the direct um, current, um, the current is constant, right? And with alternating current, that current is gonna innately drive itself down back to zero as it alternates, right? So it makes it easier for us to be able to clear an alternating current fault. Um, one thing that I wanted to also discuss, right, is going to be um, the utilization of fuses um, in situations where the fuse may be misapplied um, for a voltage um, that is greater than its maximum rating, right? And, volt and so the voltages are the maximum rating and when a fuse is placed in an application where the application exceeds that fuse's maximum voltage rating, um, a lot of people think that, you know, hey, something will happen, right? No, that's not the case. It's going to actually still um, work, so to speak, right? So nothing will happen until a fault occurs, though. And then once that fault occurs, then that fuse is going to open um, and cause a catastrophe, right? And so, for example, just to think of it, if, if we have a 600-volt fuse on a 1,000-volt system, right, you turn the switch on, nothing happens because there's no overcurrent present. However, like I said, once the fuse tries to open during this overcurrent condition, um, it, it's going to see the excess voltage. Um, it sort of runs out of those notches that we spoke about, right? Like all of those different notches on those elements. And we only have so many of those notches that can spread the voltage um, across the element. And by the time it hits the voltage, um, those elements burn off um, and where those elements burn off, it can cause a catastrophic failure um, because it was not designed to handle um, that specific voltage. And in the next example here, I have a video um, from our high power lab in Newburyport, and it's always nice to kind of show some videos to kind of give you guys an idea of what is actually going on with the um, misapplication of fuses. Um, in this specific ap application, we, we actually did utilize a, a, a DC fuse, a 600 volt DC fuse, and we tried to push a thousand volts um, through the fuse. As you see, the fuse is trying to, to clear the fault, right? But it, it's overheating, continuously overheating. The elements are melting. We have a fire, right? It's really a, a, a catastrophic event that's occurring, especially if this is within any type of enclosure. And then we have, and then we have the arc flash event, right? And you can hear the the lab technician saying, "Hey, that's 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 enough, right? Let's uh let's end the the test, right?" Um, so you can see how important it is that we we don't um, misapply fuses um, in applications, specifically whenever the fuse is say, like I said, size for six hundred volts, and we're putting it in in an application for um, one thousand. So that, that brings us to the, the next slide in our next portion of the presentation, which really we want to get into, hey, why are we using these current limiting devices, right? We talked about it protecting um, people and equipment. Um, but first of all, we need to know what the overcurrent is and what type of overcurrent conditions exist. 
um, as some of you may know, right, an overcurrent is any current in excess of a conductor's ampacity um, or the equipment's continuous current rating. Um, and, and there are two types of overcurrents, um, the short circuits and overloads, right? And we'll talk about the short circuits and overloads, and I'll go into how those, how the fuses play a part in short circuits and overloads. Um, a short circuit, as you guys may know, typically happens uh, very quickly. Um, it's short, short duration um, and time, a high spike of electrical energy, right? And it's, it's typically more than 10 times the normal operating current. Um, and it usually may be caused by um, insulation breakdown um, of the falling, falling of metal objects, um, and, and those type of, of events, uh, we when we are talking about short circuit currents, are, are also faults and and face to face faults. Um, short circuits or faults will cause component damage, right? If there's no protection. And just to give you guys a, an idea of, of what's going on, here's another video that we have um, of a short circuit event. Another one that we filmed in our Newburyport facility. Right. Um, and in this video, um, you know, we have uh, about I think it's either 500 to 750 MCM cable. I've been told different things. Right. That we actually loop around the bus bar and it's currently playing. So it's, it's, it's in uh, slow motion. Right. So as you can see, once we apply that short circuit to the cable, the electromagnetic forces begin to whip around the cable um, and, and can create a tremendous amount of heat. Right, so that, that is how violent these short circuit and these faults can be. And then going into other types of overcurrents, now we're gonna talk about overloads, which is really the most common occurrence of, of overcurrents, right? Um, as we know in our homes, this is why we kind of have a lot of, that's why we build homes with circuit breakers, right? Because it's, a lot of times we see overload conditions, um, but the fuses can also work in these overload conditions. Um, and the overloads are, are roughly less than 10 times the rate of current versus those short circuit um, faults where those are really fast in nature. The overload um, currents happen over a duration of time, right? And I actually have another example of an overload condition where, you know, we overloaded another 500 to 750 MCM cable um, between two bus bars in the lab. Um, this video is actually in real time. All right, and as you can see, as we apply the overload to the cable, um, to the point of failure, the, the cable begins to heat up, right? Um, and then the cable is going to begin to sag underneath its own pressure um, to the point where it's going to basically light up like a light bulb. All right, let's just give it a chance to kind of play through. All right, and really, we just wanted to show, you know, how, um, you know, catastrophic these short circuit and overload events can be. Um, so as I mentioned, it begins to sag underneath its own weight. Um, and right when you see the, it starts to light up basically like a, like a light bulb. Um, and then the, the cable is going to um, lose its connection right at the point of the connection. And it's actually going to fall to the ground. And in this situation, it's going to cause a fire, right? So with overload conditions, um, we're really concerned, you know, with the fire hazard of those overload conditions that can occur. So another um, question for you guys, um, what two types of overcurrents are fuses designed to protect against? And this one is not a multiple choice question. You have to type in the two types of overcurrents that fuses are designed to protect against. So if you guys don't mind, um, just go ahead on and add that to, to the chat if you think you have the answer. Don't worry, we're not we're not going to uh, take this and, and show your employer if you don't know the answer. It's quite all right, guys. Um, but I'll, I'll proceed on and give you guys the answer. And and the answer is overloads and short circuits are the two type of overcurrent conditions uh, fuses are designed to protect against. Um, so how do these fuses perform um, during these overcurrent situations, right? Uh, first of all, you know, we can look at a typical uh, time current curve, um, and these can be pulled up in the Easy Power uh, program, right? They have, you guys have access to all of the fuses 
uh, within that Easy Power program. Um, so here's a, a fuse performance curve for an AJT um, 100. Um, and this is an average melting time current curve for the AJT 100. Um, to the left on the vertical axis, you have the time, right? So this is the, the, the time that occurred. To the left, we have the time, right, on the left axis. Um, and then on the horizontal, horizontal axis, we have the available fault current. Um, and when we're looking at the curves, right, the uh, short circuit region is going to be typically the area um, below the 0.1 second portion of the curve. And the overload region is going to be above this 0.1 second of the curve, right? So like I said, when, when we're thinking about those time delay dual element fuses, right, it has a, the overload capabilities, um, right, but then also that short circuit capability. Right, so how do we read the curve? Um, pretty sure some of you guys may be familiar with this. If, if you're not, um, we're gonna go through how to read the curve. Uh, first of all, we wanna find um, the available fault current. Right, in this situation, the available fault current is about 400 amps. So we follow this line of the graph until we hit the point on the AJT curve. And then we follow that line to the left so we can see the time it's going to take for that fuse to open, right? And in this situation, in this particular example, um, this 100 amp um, class J fuse uh, will open in about 30 seconds, right? When it sees 400 amps. Um, similarly um, to the time current curves, um, we have the, the peak let through curves, right? Um, and the peak let through curves, um, they really, they tell us, um, the peak and the RMS current a fuse will let through when it operates. Um, similar to the time current curve, uh, when we find the available um, RMS current, we follow it up and once it hits the red fuse curve, we draw a line to the other axis and read the peak let through current, right? Um, in this case, right, with uh, about 50,000 av available RMS, so we, we, like I said, we, we go over, we have 50,000 available RMS. We follow this portion all the way up to the, the AJT portion of it, the peak led through curve, right? And then once we hit the curve, then we go over to the left so we can get the peak value, right? So at 50,000 amps, um, the AJT will let through 9,000 amps of peak current. Now that's important to know because it's, the available fault current is in RMS, right? But the graph here for the AJT is showing in peak current. So in order um, for us to be able to get the value the AJT will let through in peak um, in, in RMS current, we use the same method. And the, this is called the, the, um, the up and over method, right? That you guys may be familiar with, right? So we, we again, we go to the available fault current at 50,000 amps. We follow the fuse up until the, we follow the, the graph up until it hits the AJT curve. Then we go over to this bluish gray line, right? And instead of going all the way over to the peak on this side of the curve, uh, we go down, right? So we go up, and over, and down. And once we read the portion of the curve, at this at this point, we can see um, that the available um, RMS current will be about let's see one, two, three, four thousand um, RMS current. The AJT um, will let through whenever it sees a uh, fifty thousand um, available RMS amps. If that makes any sense for you guys, so we'll I'll I'll go into how this ties into the fuse performance, right? And looking at the fuse performance and how that, that fuse led through current um, is utilized whenever we are um, sizing fuses for applications, All right? So now that we kind of know how to read the fuse curve, um, let's just take a look at, you know, when a building has a short circuit event, right? So this is the, the available fault current um, within the building, right? That's the red curve. Um, and this, this is going to be our full load amps available, right? And then this is going to be our fuse let through current, right? So you'll notice that the fuse current 
is, is definitely higher than the full load amps, but it is significantly lower than the available fault current, right? The fuse's job is really to reduce the magnitude, right? So the height of this curve, right? It's, it's, it wants to reduce this available fault current and drive it down as low as possible, right? And it also wants to reduce the time duration of the fault. So it will open um, in the first half cycle of this, of this particular fault event. So a fuse's operation is, is really to reduce the magnitude and the time duration of a fault. So let's take a look at how the fuse does its job um, by looking at the fuse led through current. Um, we can find um, how much peak current the fuse will let through by measuring, again, um, like we saw in the charts from zero um, to the wave's absolute peak. And basically this is how peak led through curves are created. So what's going on um, within the fuse during the, the overcurrent condition? Um, the first part is the, the melting time the I squared T, um, which is basically a measure of thermal energy um, associated with the current. Um, and during this time, the fuse curve is increasing um, to its absolute peak, right? So it's increasing to that absolute peak here. And when the fuse hits the peak point, there's an arc that forms because the element has melted um, at the notches, those notches that I showed you guys. Like I said, this is the short circuit element and the voltage um, is arcing across uh, the element, right? So as it arcs across the element, you can see this is kind of just a, a visual depiction of, of what's going on. And after that fuse reaches its peak um, and starts to go back down to zero, um, this is actually called the arcing time. So this section of this curve is called the arcing time, right? And, and the filler is going to quench the arc, right? Um, and that as the as the filler, um, the sand begins to melt, it, it kind of turns into this glass like material, um, which ends up being a great insulator and really assist um, and helps disconnect the circuit. Um, so why are these fuse values important? Um, it, they're really important when designing applications um, and, and specifically if we're talking about selectivity um, or coordination. Uh, between two fuses, we have to look at the time current curves and the portion not represented on those time current curves, um, which is below 0 0.01 seconds. So in order to represent that data, uh, we have to look at the clearing I squared T of the branch fuse, right? And we have to compare that to the melting I squared T of the main fuse, right? Um, what we're doing here basically is we want to be sure that the branch fuse um, clears the fault before the main fuse begins to melt um, to avoid nuisance openings of upstream fuses, All right? So taking a look at our example, right? We have basically a, a branch fuse with the clearing I squared T um, of a thousand amps. And then this main fuse has a melting I squared T of 1500 amps. And so based on this information, um, the fuses will be selective and the branch fuse will clear the fault before the main fuse element begins to melt, um, which is going to avoid that opening of that main fuse, right? So it's just a reminder that, hey, you know, we have to consider more than just the time current curves uh, when trying to coordinate fuses when designing applications. Again, uh, another quiz time, right? So um, what two things uh, does a fuse limit during an overcurrent event? And if you guys want to take the time to respond in the chat, I'll give you guys a couple of seconds. Okay. I wish I had one of the little Jeopardy noises. <laughs> okay. And so the answer to this is going to be the magnitude and the duration, right? Uh, whenever I was showing you guys those curves on the previous slides, right, um, and we were talking about the available fault current, and we were looking at that available fault current versus that peak let through current of the, the fuse, right? Um, we, we talked about how the fuse's job is to literally uh, reduce that magnitude of that fault and also reduce the time 
that that fault occurs. And, and the reason is because the, the quicker we can quench that arc, um, the faster, you know, we can protect people, especially in arc flash events. Um, and then also the, the quicker we can protect the equipment um, that is that the fuse is protecting that's downstream from the fuse. Um, so it, it's really, truly um, important to kind of understand these concepts in regards to the fuse and the fuse performance, because this is the main functionality of the fuse. So looking at the time delay fuse, right, and, and the performance um, for the time delay fuse, right, remember we discussed uh, the spring and plunger assembly, right, this is what the spring and plunger assembly is here, um, and its connection to the element um, by that eutectic solder, um, which is designed and, and calibrated to melt um, at a specific temperature. Um, once it hits that temperature and melts the spring, um, the spring draws the plunger back, right? So the spring draws this plunger back and basically disconnects the circuit, right? Which allows us to have that overload protection. So looking at an example, when we want to utilize time delay fuse, right? A common use for time delay fuses is really to protect motors. Um, when an electric motor starts, um, it draws high current for a short duration of time. Um, typically, we know this as either the lock rotor current or the, the inrush current, um, which may be around 600% um, of the full load current um, for two to 10 seconds. And, and once that motor reaches its full speed, the current it then drops back down, right? And, and we can represent this, this motor starting current um, by drawing a line across the peak here of the sine wave and then trying to transfer that information into um, uh, onto the time current curve so we can see how our fuses um, react to those situations and why we want to utilize the time delay um, versus a, a non-time delay fuse um, in regards to sizing fuses for motors. Um, so pictured here we have our AJT100 which is going to be our time delay fuse, and we have our A4J100, which is going to be the fast acting fuse, right? So like I said, we can draw the motor curve, right? And this is a, a, a 50 horsepower motor um, with about a full load current of 65 amps. And we can clearly see that the A4J um, will open substantially before uh, the, the motor fully starts, right? So at this portion, we can see before the motor fully starts, this A4J is saying it wants, I want to do my job, I want to open, right? And you can see that the AJT100 is steady at its job. It's not wanting to open. It has that time delay feature. So it is going to allow that motor um, to start um, and, and continue its operation. Um, so we can clearly see why we want to utilize the time delay fuse um, for these motor applications. Um, another thing that is important to note, right, um, it's important to note that the time delay fuse um, can actually be more current limiting um, and provide better protection than a non-time delay fuse. Um, Fast or fast acting fuse, sometimes those terms are used interchangeably depending on the manufacturer, but non-time delay and fast acting fuses are very similar in nature, um, as is the case for the, the AJT100 versus that the A4J100. Um, so first we're gonna look at the time delay fuse, the AJT100, and we can see um, at the peak point, right, where the current limitation begins, um, and compare this to the non-time delay fuse by drawing a curve um, for the non-time delay fuse kind of over the AJT100, right? And you can see that the AJT100 is going to be more current limiting um, than the, the A4J100, right? The time delay fuses are, are really typically the newer technology um, they're newer design, and, and, and so with that, they are a better design, and you can actually use a time delay fuse even when you don't need the time delay feature, um, unless with, we're thinking about semiconductor fuses and semiconductor applications, um, but those are different, right, uh, compared to uh, what these 
these UL low voltage fuses are going to be utilized for. So going into um, some of the causes of failures of fuses, right, and what can cause a fuse to failure to fail, um, that's going to be cycle fatigue, right, which can occur in these motor applications. We know that the motors, uh, they're stopping, they're starting, and whenever they do that, they're drawing power. And then also whenever you have um, motors that are driving pump systems, those 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 motors are utilizing VFDs, so they're, they're varying the frequency, so they're varying the power that is being used, right? So this, this can cause a situation where the fuse is heating up, the fuse is cooling down, it's heating up and cooling down, it's continuously going through that cycle, right? And, and, and because it's going through that cycle, um, if we were to cut that fuse open, so this is kind of a cutaway of the fuse here, Right, you, you're gonna notice the notches get sort of this S bend, right? The fuse element, um, unfortunately, it can't expand and contract forever, right? It's kind of like if you have a piece of metal or a piece of aluminum, if you continuously bend it back and forth, back and forth, eventually um, it's going to break, right? So typically when we want to examine cycle fatigue, uh, we, we will cut the fuse open and then we can you may be able to see it with the naked eye, but a lot of times you're going to have to be able to see this cycle fatigue underneath the microscope. So continuing on with the, the low voltage uh, general purpose UL fuse offerings that are available in the market. Um, first and foremost, right, uh, these are all UL um, 248 fuses, right? This is the UL 248 is the standard for all low voltage fuses. Um, we have first and foremost the class L fuse, which is going to be from 100 to 6,000 amp fuse, um, and these are going to be rated for 600 volts. Um, then we have the class J fuse, which is going to be from 1 to 600 amps and about 600 volts. Then we have the class T fuse, um, which is 1 to 1,200 amps, um, 300 at 300 volts, and then up to 800 amps at 600 volts. And these are compact in size and they have no time delay feature. Um, next, continuing on is the, the class K5 fuse. These are typically known as a one-time fuse. Um, and these class K5 fuses um, can be rated from one to 600 amps um, at 250 volts to 600 volts. We continue on to the RK5 fuse. Um, which can be rated from 1 to 600 amps and 250 to 600 volts. The Class CC fuse, uh, which are control circuit fuses and are rated at 30 amps and below, and of course at 600 volts. And then we get into the midget class fuses, which are 30 amps and lower, um, 600 volts, but it also could be 250 volts. Um, there's no uh, UL definition. Um, for the midget fuse in regards to if it has to be 600 volts or 250 volts, it just really depends on the manufacturer as these fuses are designed to be utilized for supplemental protection only. And, and last but not least, we have the class RK1 fuse, again, um, zero to 600 amps, 250 volts and, and up to 600 volts. So looking at, you know, the, the UL fuel fuse offering kind of like a little bit more in detail um, and really going through what we discussed with those ferro style fuses, right? We talked about that ferro design is going to be from zero to 60 amps. And then once we get above 60 amps, depending on the manufacturer, we choose to at 60, 61 amps to 100 amps, we actually go to the blade construction. And then as you can see, as it goes all the way up to 600 amps, all of those fuses utilize the blade construction. And so tying in these uh, UL low voltage fuses um, and, and how they all kind of relate to each other and what is the history um, behind uh, these fuses and, and why, you know, why did we go from the class H to the K5 to the RK5 to the RK1 fuses? Well, first and foremost, the class H fuses, they have no fill and, and are non-current limiting, right? They are, they typically only have a a 10,000 amp interrupting rating. Um, the K5 fuse does have a feel, but is a lower grade feel compared to that RK1 and RK5. These are lower cost 
fuses, and they only have a 50,000 um, amp interrupting rating. And then once we get to the RK5, we start getting into that silica sand that we mentioned, also utilizing those copper elements. And these have a 200,000 uh, amp interrupting rating. And then the more higher end fuses, which is going to be the RK1 fuse, is also going to have the silica sand, but typically is going to have a silver element, which like I mentioned, depending on the element is going to depend, depend on the the current limitation ability of that fuse. So we're utilizing that silver element because of its current limitation abilities, right? And the, the, the RK1 is also gonna have a 200,000 amp interrupting rating. And it's important to note, like I said, you know, the, the RK1 versus the RK5, the RK1 is going to have about five times more um, current, lim current limiting capabilities compared to that RK5. All right, so now that we've uh, kind of, we talked about, you know, the construction of the fuse, uh, we, we spoke about some of the applications, the misapplication of the fuses, um, also all of the different overcurrent conditions, and then all of the different UL classes, and really kind of getting into what I just discussed previously, um, which is those current limiting capabilities of those fuses based off of the class of the fuse, right? So looking at um, the current limiting capabilities, we can see as we have in our previous example, right, if we have the building's uh, full load um, current available and then also the available fault current within the building, if we're going to utilize the RK5 fuse, um, we can see that versus that RK1 fuse, there is a significant difference, about 80% difference in the current limiting capabilities of this RK5 versus the RK1 fuse. Um, and versus the Class J fuse, we can see the RK1 is, a uh, the Class J slightly over outperforms the RK1 fuse. And what's important here to note is that the RK1 and RK5 fuses, um, those are gonna be typically utilized um, in in retrofit for installations, right? Um, because the RK1 and RK5, in regards to dimensions, they can replace that class K fuse and those H fuses. Um, and then the, the class J fuses are gonna be typically utilized for those new installations um, because it kind of gets into a little bit more detail, but the class J is a rejection style fuse by size. So that class J fuse cannot be replaced by RK1 or RK5 in regards to putting it into the same uh, fuse holder, right? Um, so as you can see, it's, it's understanding the current limiting capabilities of these fuses is critical um, in being able to protect uh, those people and those systems. And in the next slide, I have a, a, a comparison to really give you guys a, a visual uh, representation of, of what is going on with this current limitation that I'm discussing. So this is another video that was also filmed in our uh, Newberry Port Facility High Power Lab. And first and foremost, this is this is mimicking a six cycle breaker, right? It doesn't have a fuse. So this is like I said, no fuses, 18,000 available amps. The next, we're going to utilize the RK5 fuse. We can see the difference in that in the first not, not so much, but then we're going to go into the RK5 fuse again, right? Just so we can be sure that we can understand what's going on. Not, not as much as the previous explosion. But then when we get into the RK1 fuse, you can see the substantial difference in the current. And this is the point we see itself again. Here, I mean, that is a significant difference, right? I mean, the RK1 fuse, that is more of a I would call a firecracker, right? That, that's not going to do a lot of damage to anybody um, that is working within those enclosures. It's not gonna do any damage to 
the to the equipment that is downstream from the fuse that the fuse is protecting. Um, and that really brings me to the end of my presentation. That brings me to the end of my presentation, guys. Um, I'm not sure if you have any questions for me. Um, please type them into the, the question box. If you guys do have any questions, I'm, I'm open to answer those questions. I think we have about nine minutes remaining. remaining. Um, hopefully, you know, that was a, a nice refresher for, for some of you who may already be familiar um, with fuses, um, may already be familiar with, with uh, utilizing fuses for those specific applications. Um, and then for those that are not kind of a real high level overview and understanding of the fuse construction and, and how we utilize fuses to protect um, people and equipment. Good job, David. Thanks, Jim. Uh, there's a question came in that you may want to check out. Alonzo is asking for arc flash calculations, what current is used? Is it the fault current or the value the fuse will limit the fault to? Let's see, let me look up. When, when using current limiting fuses, which current is used in the arc flash calculation? The fault current or the value of the fuse will limit uh, the fault to uh, both, right? We have to utilize both. We have to know what the um, the available fault current is, and we have to know what that fuse will limit that fault current to, right? And once we we know what the fuse can limit the fault current to, right? As you've seen in that example with that RK1 fuse, now we can we can um, basically determine right that level of PPE that needs to be utilized within that that arc flash boundary zone. And depending on those incident energies um, that we are able to calculate based off of utilizing that current limitation of the fuse would depend on, you know, what we set for those arc flash boundaries. And the other question, David, is uh, some are asking for copies of your slides. Can we make a PDF version available along with the video? Oh, of course. We can. I can make a PDF version. I'll send it right over to you, Jim. All right. And you guys can have that available to you. I'm not sure if the videos will still work. We'll, we'll see and get through those details, yeah. but definitely the, the PDF version. For those sure. are some awesome videos. <laughs> I have to yeah, that's pre they're pretty cool. I got a chance to go to the high power lab one time and blow up some stuff. That's yeah. always fun when you get to blow up things. <laughs> well, thank you much. And we look forward to maybe having a presentation down the road. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, thanks so much to Easy Power for hosting this webinar. Um, and hopefully you guys um, enjoyed it and was able to, to get something from the presentation. And you guys have a great evening. So long. Thank you.